So chap this chapter here, chapter uh, six in microbiology, focuses on the viruses. You already heard some things about them so far. Well, now we're going to talk a lot more about them. We call viruses acellular because they're not cells. You got a couple of questions on that one, right? Um, they lack cells. The the the, the the machinery to be an individual cell, like a separate cell that does not rely on anything else. They are basically a protein package with either either DNA or RNA. As far as we know so far, we have not found a virus that has both DNA and RNA. So that's why I said the key word is either. So. It's just like a package. The package is made up of protein. The container is made up of protein. But what's inside the package is either DNA or RNA, RNA but not both. So far, because you never know what scientists will discover, all right? So that word so far keeps me um, safe. But the word virus was coined by a pastor a long time ago, and it is actually Latin for the word poison. A long time ago, they we eventually found out about bacteria, and we thought bacteria were the smallest uh, microorganisms known to man at that time. And the problem is they used <coughs> infected um, uh, infected fluids from patients and they filtered them out. So they used filters that would trap the smallest known bacteria at, the, at that time. And they, they used the filtrate. So after they filtered, they used the filtrate, that, the, what comes out of the filter. That means it's supposedly no bacteria in it. And that's true because they use the filter that traps all known bacteria. And then when they use the filtrate, it still caused infection or disease. So they basically concluded there is something smaller than bacteria that's causing disease. And now we know they're viruses. Viruses can technically infect any type of cell. I am not saying that a virus can infect, a specific virus can infect all types of cells. No, no, thank God. They are cell specific. They're also host specific. Some viruses infect one organism, but not the others. Like for example, the bacteriophages. What do you think they infect? Bacteria. Bacteria. Bacteriophages infect bacteria. But that's all they infect. So some viruses are host specific. We also have viruses that are cell specific. So you might get a virus that only infects your lungs. You might get a virus that only infects your liver. You might get a virus that infects multiple cells. So anything goes. But the take home message here is that if you're a cell, most likely there's a virus out there ready to infect you. So they can infect any kind of cell. We don't call viruses alive or dead. We don't say this is a dead virus or this is a living virus. We can't call them alive because they lack the characteristics of life. In general biology, day one of gen bio, you should have heard of the characteristics of life. What does it mean to be alive? Well, you have to have the ability to process energy independently. You have to have the ability to reproduce, respond to the environment regularly, grow and develop, evolutionary adaptation. Those are, that's Gen Bio 1. Those are the criteria of life. If you look at an amoeba, for example, it can do all of those things. It can reproduce, it can process energy, it can respond to the environment, it can, reg it can do everything because it's alive. Bacteria can do all those things because it's a lot. But when it comes to cell, uh, viruses, they can't do that on their own because they're not alive. 
So because they're not alive, you can't call them dead either. So we call them active inactive. That's better. So if there's a virus on the countertop, that's an inactive virus. Because viruses need host cells to become active. You see? They cannot fulfill the criteria of life on their own. They have to infect you, meaning your cells. They have to get into your cells to become active. Active to do what? To multiply. That's it. As far as we know, that's all they do. And when they do that, of course, they cause disease in you and I. So we can also refer to them as infectious particles because they are infectious rather than us calling them as an organism. Because if you call it an organism, you're implying that it can live on its own, but it can't. It needs a host cell. Not only that, it needs to live within. Sorry, I, I made a mistake. Not live. It needs to replicate within the cell. See, it's so easy to make that mistake because we're used to saying living and dead and all that. But we're not we're used to saying active and inactive. So just by default, you go into that using those words. So but watch out for that. It needs a host cell to replicate. So the fact that this relationship is mandatory, that's what this word it means, implies. Obligate. Obligate means obligatory, means mandatory. It is absolutely mandatory that the virus lives with, I see, I said it again, lives. <laughs> that it activates within your cell. Within your cell. And because of that, we would call it a parasite, an intracellular parasite, because it, got, it will cause disease. So we have to put all these three words together. It is a parasite because it causes disease. And because it's inside your cells, it's called intracellular. And because that relationship is mandatory for the virus, not for you, you don't want that. For the virus, it becomes obligate. So every time you hear the word obligate, you think of the word mandatory, it's a must. So obligate intracellular parasite. Because if it wants an enzyme, it's not going to come with it. It doesn't need to come with it. It knows you have it in your cells. Let's say it wants DNA polymerase. Let's say it needs to use DNA polymerase to make what? DNA polymerase. That's a gen bio question. What do we use DNA polymerase to make? DNA polymerase makes DNA. There it is. If it needs to use DNA polymerase, it does not need to come with it because it knows you have it in your cells. I always tell my students, think of a virus as an unwanted guest coming, ringing your doorbell. And unlucky for you, you open the door. The unwanted guest walks into your foyer and says these words, your house is now mine. Everything you own in your house is now mine and you will bow down to my commands. That's not a guest you want, right? That's what a virus will do. It will ring your doorbell of your cells and it will walk in and command everything in your cells, like your ribosomes, your enzymes, to obey. Make copies of me. That's what it will do. Yes, sir. Can cells, uh, or not cells, can uh, viruses, can they evolve? Oh yeah, they do, they change. That's what the problem is with things like the flu and so forth. Once you figure out something, to, then it changes, then you have a different strain. Yeah, they do. Because they have genetic material, yeah. So this is the summary. It's like a go-to list for all the things that we're about to talk about. 
So if you can reproduce this information from your mind, you are pretty good with this chapter. All right. So we'll go with it. We'll go through it by going through this slide. So we already talked about some of these things that they're not cells. So we call them what? Acellular. Good. We already talked about the fact that they are obligate intracellular parasites. That means they they activate. See, I'm almost said it again. They activate within your cells. And what do they do? They just make copies of themselves. Eventually, all those copies will be leaving your cell, infecting other cells. Yes? Oh, yeah. A cell, you're, you're thinking about the exam, right? A cell here means um, not made up of cells, like viruses. That's the, the example of that. Um, unicellular means whatever the organism is, is made up of one cell. That's like the amoeba, for example, bacteria, for example, archaea, for example. So in that exam question, there was two choices were correct, bacteria and archaea. Forget, put that behind you, all right? Let's focus on this. You're, you wait until the exam is graded, and then you come and look at your exam. All right, so one other characteristics of, characteristic of viruses, besides the fact that they're acellular, besides the fact that they are all, sorry, they are obligate intracellular parasites, they are not just microscopic, they are <laughs> ultra microscopic. That's equivalent to me saying they are very, very small. You need an electron microscope to see these guys. So think about what you did in the lab. Remember the E. coli that was on your gram stain? It stained a pinkish reddish color, right? Think back. Do you remember how small it was? It was really small, right? And you had to go all the way into oil immersion to see it. That's this one. So they're trying to show you in relationship to something that you're familiar with. How small is a virus? Well, think back to the gram staining lab. And think back how small that pink bacillus was, the rod-shaped bacterium, E. coli was. It was tiny. And that would be this. HIV would be this. That means it's really small. And then you have the polio virus would be really, 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 really small. And so forth. Now, I am not going to expect you to remember the size of these things. Are you kidding me? That is useless in my point of view. All you need to come up with is here is that the viruses are not just microscopic. They are ultra microscopic. And you need what to see them? Electron microscope. Electron microscope. That's the take from this. We already talked about this, that the viruses are just like containers. It's like a package that you take to the post office. The package that you would take to the post office is made up of a cardboard box. Am I right? This package is made up of a protein box. It's not cardboard. Inside your package, there's a gift or a toy or whatever. Inside this package, there is either DNA or but not, there you go. All right. So they, some of them at least look like this. You have some that fall under the category of what is referred to as naked viruses versus enveloped viruses. Now, why do they call this one a naked virus? Because it doesn't have an envelope, that's all. See, the difference between this one and this one is the fact that this one has an envelope. That's this part right here. And this one does not. That's why they call it a naked virus. The packaging, the protein package, is made up of monomers, simple subunits, called capsomeres. This is a capsomere. Follow me here. This triangle piece right here. That's a capsomere. That's another capsomere. Another capsomere, and so forth. Here are capsomeres too. 
It's like that cardboard box that you take to your post office. Imagine if that box came in pieces and you had to put the pieces together to make the box. That's what it would be equivalent to. So the monomers are called capsimers, but once you put them together, when you have the container, now the container is called a capsid. You don't call it a box. You call it a capsid. So now we put it together. The capsid is made up of simple subunits called capsomeres. What's inside it is nucleic acids, either DNA or RNA, but not both. See, every time I say that, I say that phrase because repetition is how you retain things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Capsomeres? Capsomeres. You'll see the word as I switch the slide. Let me show you what, what, how to spell it. Here it is. Capsomeres. So the difference between a naked virus and an envelope virus, again, the envelope virus has an envelope. The naked virus does not. Now, there's another component to the virus that is very important for you to know and understand are, is what's called a spike protein. Spike proteins, look at that. Spike proteins. You know how I tell you that pictures in biology or any other science, really, pictures speak a thousand words. Have you ever heard that phrase before? Mm -hmm. This one is speaking 10,000 words. How's that? Study the pictures, because I can get five questions just from the pictures on the exam. Here's one possible question that can show up on the exam. Hint, hint, right? Where are the spike proteins found in the naked virus versus the envelope virus? Well, look at them. Where? Location. The spike proteins are found attached to the capsomeres on the naked virus. Whereas the spike proteins are found attached to the envelope of the... There it is. This is my point of view of saying pictures speak a thousand words. Please study the pictures in your book and your PowerPoints. I literally sometimes go to the PowerPoint slide. I don't even look at the information. I look at the picture and make up a question on it. You may have seen some of those kind of questions today in the exam, on the exam. Now, now that we know that, what's the function of the spike proteins? Well, with respect to the virus, the function of the spike protein would behave similar to, remember I told you what, viruses are like unwanted guests, right? coming to ring your doorbell. Am I right? The spike protein is like the unwanted guest's finger about to ring your doorbell. You'll understand the analogy, trust me. All right? So that technically speaking, the spike protein is what's going to attach or touch the surface of your cell. See, I'm equating your house as your cell and your doorbell as a cell receptor or surface protein on your cells. So if I have to draw it on the board, and I will, I'll show you what it would look like. If this is the surface of your cells, this is the surface of your cell. Let's say you have a receptor on the surface of your cell. So this is your cell, like your house. And this is like your doorbell. You catching that? Well, this would be, for example, the capsomere. And it would be the virus, of course. And this would be the spike protein. So the spike protein is on the surface of the virus. 
whether it's directly attached to the capsimer or directly attached to the envelope, that's irrelevant. Because attached to the capsimer, it tells you it's a naked virus. Attached to the envelope, it tells you it's an envelope virus. That's the difference. But it works the same way. It will interact with the protein on the surface of your cell. Now, you gotta understand something. This protein is not there for that purpose. This protein is there for other things that have to do with you, with your cell. It's doing things for you. That's why it's there. But this virus happens to bind to that protein, just by chance alone. The spike protein happens to bind to the surface of your cells. It's like saying, not every unwanted guest will come knocking on your door. Some unwanted guests will come knocking on the, at your neighbor's house, not your house. And some will come knocking on your door. Here, I'll show you something. So here's an example of that. Here's another virus. But the spike protein of this virus looks like this. This virus will not come knocking on your door because it doesn't fit. But this one does. Do you see that? This is me saying not every virus will infect every cell. Or not every virus will infect every host as well. Because of this what's called specificity. Say that ten times, right? This is called specificity. This has specificity with this one, but this one does not. Why? Because of the simple interaction between them, that's all. This one fits, this one doesn't. This could be your liver cell, and that's why this one would cause hepatitis, but this one won't, because it doesn't interact with your liver cell. Yes? Are there certain proteins in the spike protein that would actually want to, like, does it search out for a certain cell? Or like you said, it's by chance. But it's by chance. So it, it doesn't matter. See, now the virus is circulating in you, right? How does it know, this is your liver, like that. It's going to try knocking on the other door, but they won't it won't be able to ring the bell because it, there's no interaction. But this one, it will. And that's how you get, for example, hep A, hep B, hep C infecting liver cells, but not other cells, through this specificity. So when this one binds to your cell receptor protein or surface protein, it's like knocking on your door. You foolishly open the door. And then we'll see what happens to that cell. It's amazing. So we call that specificity. And it really doesn't matter if the spike protein is on the surface of envelope protein, or uh, the envelope of envelope viruses, or directly on the surface of the capsimers on naked viruses. They will do the same thing. Now, once they enter your cells, they're gonna activate, which basically means multiply, and they're gonna eventually leave. Thank you, and they leave. But the problem is they don't leave by, in the numbers of one or two or three, they leave in the thousands because they replicated inside your cell. They leave as virions, fully formed viruses ready to infect you once again. So they come, they come in, they multiply, and they leave infectious particles. And those are called virions. Those are what's left in the body? Yeah, no, they leave the cell to infect other cells. Whether it's your cells or you sneeze them out and infect another person. But they're fully formed infectious particles. They're called virions. Virions, you can think about them as fully assembled, ready to go versus a, a virus that is not fully established, still preparing itself, still assembling, that one will not be ready to infect you. But that does not happen except in your cells. They st assemble in your cells, they get ready, and then once they leave your cell, they're gonna be virions, ready to infect you again. So you have to, you have to separate two words in this chapter here. Do not make these mis this mistake, because a lot of students make mistakes 
with the word veryan, and another word you're gonna hear later called veryoid. Veryan ends with an N. Veryoid will end with a D. They are completely different from each other. I'll tell you the main difference here so I can reinforce this information. Veryan is an infectious particle of, vi it's a virus. But a veryoid is a piece of RNA that infects plants. It's completely different. It's not a virus. And we only talk about veryoids with a D, like for 10 seconds and we're done. But the whole chapter is on the veryon. So when in doubt, answer, veryon. <laughs> Do you see that? It's called test taking strategy, yes? From the virus, Oh yeah. yeah. It takes if it's one virus, it will go in, invade that cell, multiply, come out, invade the neighboring cells, and yeah. Yeah. and then you'll get sick once uh, a large number of your cells are involved in the problem. Yeah. So the shape of these capsids, they come in different shapes. Some of them are helical, like this. Some of them are isohedral, like this one. So the take home message here is they come in different shapes and varieties. And some of them look like this alien looking thing. You know, if they're looking for aliens, they don't need to look anymore. I don't know, that looks like an alien to me, right? But fortunately this guy only infects bacteria. So this guy is the, your bacteriophage and some students think that what an artistic mind. No, 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 it's a real thing. Here it is. That's what it looks like under the electron microscope. So it's not some artist trying to be cute here. This is what it really looks like under the electron microscope. It comes complete with tail fibers, tail pins, the genetic material inside the capsid head, and it almost acts like a needle. You know when you go and take a shot, like they give you a shot? That's what it's actually kind of acting like. It's landing on the surface of bacteria. I'm using my arm as if it's bacteria. This does not infect you, thank God. I don't think I would want something that looks like that on me. But it lands on the surface of bacteria and it punctures the cell membrane with the tail fins. So it lands with the tail fibers, pokes the cell membrane with the tail pin, and injects in the bacteria, or the bacterium, the DNA. Now remember I told you that some bacteria will try to overcome this infection by producing restriction enzymes to cut the DNA, because restriction enzymes cut DNA. So who makes restriction enzymes? Bacteria. Did you see that today? Yeah. Hopefully it's good news. All right. Now, the interesting fact is this. The, the enveloped viruses, some, somebody, uh, some scientists try to figure out where do the enveloped viruses get their envelope from? They get them from you. So they get the envelope from you. Their envelope is a piece of your cell membrane. So the virus, the enveloped ones, infect your cell they're gonna assemble, they're gonna get ready to leave as a virion. On their way out, and pretend this is your cell membrane. On the way out, I gotta make sure I'm in the picture here. On the way out, they push on your cell membrane and they take a piece of it with them. So the envelope of the envelope virus is a component of your cell membrane. If you have proteins in there that belong to you, they don't need them. They get rid of them and replace them with what? Pictures speak a thousand words. Pictures speak a thousand words. Replace them with what? With the spike proteins. So let me do this part again. As the envelope virus is leaving your cells, the host cell, it will take a piece of membrane from you to make it the envelope. It's like the unwanted guest. 
before it leaves you, he or she leaves your house, he says, go give me your winter jacket. I'm taking it with me. So they take your winter jacket, and if you had something on it, like whatever, they take them off and they replace them with the spike protein. So it's similar to that. I mean, the analogy is awesome. Uh, I, at least I think so. So the envelope of an envelope virus comes from the host cell. It replaces all the host proteins with the spike proteins because it doesn't need the host proteins. It needs spike proteins. Now, the genes, the instructional manual to making all the components of the virus is contained within the viral DNA. So the capsomere gene is in the viral DNA. And we don't have a capsomere gene. Why would we want to help them? I'm not going to have a capsomere gene in my DNA because that would just help them. No, no. So they know that. So they come with it. Here's the interesting thing. Viruses know what you have and what you don't have. They know you have enzymes. They know you have ribosomes. They know you have adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, the building blocks of... Life. No. What molecule? Well, you're right, but what molecule? <laughs> DNA. And instead of thymine, you also have urosol. For what? RNA. RNA. You see that? You have the ribosomes for protein synthesis. You have everything. They don't need it. They don't need to come with it. But they know you don't have the capsomere gene, so they'll come with it. They know you don't have the spike protein gene, so they'll come with it. And any other enzyme they know you don't have, they'll come with it. This is my analogy of that. You know that unwanted guest again? He's not going to want to use your toothbrush. He's going to come with one for himself. He might use your toothpaste, but not your toothbrush. That's disgusting. So he'll come with one himself. It's because he's an unwanted guest. He's going to stay in your house for a while. So that's the analogy for that. But pots and pans and food and, and chairs and TV and internet access, you have it. It'll come in and use it. It doesn't need to come with it. So again, the analogy is awesome in this case. And now the fun begins. Let's say, for whatever reason, I don't think I have that in this group. You're not listening to me. Wake up. And it's time to listen. This one is involved. I told you that the genetic material that the virus comes with is either or, but not both. When you studied general biology, what did your gen bio professor tell you about DNA? Is it single-stranded or double-stranded? Double-stranded. Double -stranded. What did your gen bio professor tell you about RNA? Is it single-stranded or double-stranded? Single-stranded. Single they lied. <laughs> well, they didn't lie-lie. They partially lied. Because when you go into microbiology, you find viruses that break the rule. Say, so in biology, in a lot of cases, that everything adds yeah, double-stranded, but for, for the most part. Until you go to this chapter, you realize, look at that. There are some viruses that have single-stranded DNA. But for the most part, DNA is double-stranded. So they didn't lie-lie, but they didn't want to burden you with that piece of information in gen bio, but I will in micro. And the same thing goes with, goes with RNA. For the most part, RNA is single-stranded until you come here and find that there are some viruses that are double-stranded RNA. So you have all kinds. There are some viruses that are single-stranded DNA, viruses that are double-stranded DNA, viruses that are single-stranded RNA, and viruses that are double-stranded RNA. It depends on which virus you're talking about. Okay, that wasn't bad. Well, the single-stranded RNA come in two varieties. Positive sense versus negative sense. Okay, now it's getting interesting. 
What's the difference between the two? The positive sense RNA are ready for translation. They don't have to do anything. The ribosome binds to it and it translates. To make what? Protein, gen bio. So if the virus is coming in with positive sense RNA, it's gonna go to work right away, making viral proteins. It's gonna hijack your ribosomes, because it doesn't need to come with ribosomes because it knows you have it. And it will start making viral proteins like the capsimers and the spike proteins, anything it wants. The instructions for that is contained in its genetic material. If the virus is coming in with negative sense RNA, then it's not ready for translation, but it can sure make itself ready. Look at that. If it's coming in with negative sense RNA, it will not start translation right away. Why? Because this has to be copied first. Then it will start translation. Wait a minute, when you copy a negative sense RNA, what do you get? A positive sense RNA. Are we catching that? Positive sense RNA viruses are, they infect you and they go to work making viral proteins. Negative sense RNA will eventually do the same thing, but they have to be copied first. They get copied inside your cell into a positive sense RNA. And that copy starts the translation process. Are we catching that? Yes, sir. So what makes the DNA different if it's single strand? It, I'll tell you, the virus come, will come in with single strand, but right away it'll copy it and become double strand. So at, in the process of it um, infecting your cell, it's going to be double stranded. And we'll see what happens to that. It's coming. All right, we continue. There are different examples here. The double-stranded DNA viruses are like your herpes simplex 2, for example. The single-stranded DNA virus are like the parvovirus, for example. The positive sense is like the polio virus. The negative sense is like the influenza virus and so forth. So they give you examples. Then you have HIV. HIV is very interesting, and I have to have a separate discussion on that one. But it is single-stranded RNA, but it becomes double-stranded DNA. This one is a weird one. It's like it takes the best of both worlds and incorporates it as HIV. We'll talk about that one. So let's look at what happens. Let's look at what happens with these viruses in general and then in more specifically, each type of virus. In general, this is the unwanted guest coming over. Adsorption is when the spike protein attaches to the surface of your cells. That's adsorption. I did not say absorption. That that's something that you would do to pick up water, absorb. This is adsorption. That means attachment. There's a big difference between absorption with a B and adsorption with a D. Adsorption is attachment. Attachment of what? Of the virus to the surface of your cells. And it's happening up here. My pointer broke, so I'm going to use my... Mouse, it is happening up here. That's adsorption. What would that be equivalent to with my analogy? Ringing the doorbell. The finger of your unwanted guest is the spike protein. Your doorbell is the host receptor surface protein. They come in contact with each other. That is... Adsorption. Then you hear the sound of the doorbell and you rush to the door to open it, unfortunately. The unwanted guest, the virus, will enter your foyer. What would that be? 
penetration. It entered your house. The unwanted guest, the virus, has a coat on called the capsid. And it's so rude to sit in your house with a coat on so it uncoats. It removes the coat. So it removes the capsid if it's a naked virus. If it's an envelope virus, it has two coats on, not just one. The outer coat would be the envelope and the inner coat would be the capsid. It removes both of them. Both of them, yeah. It uncoats. So I think you're getting the analogy here, and, and a lot of students love this because it makes sense. And if I just said absorption penetration uncoating, everybody would be like, I don't know what he just said. But now you can see the event happening and imagine it happening, and tie in the words with the event, and I think you'll be fine. Once the unwanted guest walks in, takes either both coats off if it's a Envelope of virus, or a single coat off, if it's a naked virus, doesn't matter. What matters is it uncoats, and it uncoats in your foyer. So that's your cytoplasm. So it will uncoat in your cytoplasm. So now what you have is the genomic material, the nucleic acid, whether it's RNA or DNA. Now it's the RNA or DNA in your foyer. It's like the unwanted guest comes in, takes a jacket off, and just throw it, throws it on the floor. What's left is the genomic material, either DNA or RNA, either double-stranded or single-stranded, DNA or RNA. Then it goes into your kitchen and starts making food. That's what part? Synthesis. It's not really making food. It's making viral particles. It hijacks your ribosomes and orders your ribosomes, start copying me, start making the parts of me. What's the parts of, of the virus? The capsomeres, the spike proteins, and copies of the nucleic acids. It will force your ribosomes to make copies of the proteins and other enzymes to make copies of the nucleic acids. Make copies of my parts. And then it assembles it. It's like the unwanted guest making the table, the dinner table. It's assembling things. It's going to take the capsomeres and the spike proteins to make the capsid and put one of these in there. So it's going to take one of the nucleic acids and put it in the package. And the package is going to be made up of capsomeres and spike proteins. That's assembly. And when it's all said and done, it will say bye-bye and it will leave. That's release. But it will leave in the thousands. If one or two viruses infect you, thousands of viruses will be leaving that cell. They will be leaving as virions, fully formed viruses ready to infect you. Are we catching this? You're good? So, I'm gonna just keep going and we'll stop at a certain point here. There's a certain point I wanna stop at. You have to remember the phrase that I'm about to say. It will save you on the exam. And it will help in your understanding of these things. The virus leaves the same way it comes in. And I don't mean through the same door. No, no, no. I mean, the virus that infects you is gonna be the virus that leaves you, leaves your cell, because it's copying itself. I mean, you're not gonna get infected by uh, hepatitis and then it copies and leaves as uh, herpes. No. If you get infected by a hepatitis virus, it will copy itself and leave as the hepatitis virus. That's what I mean by that. I don't mean by the same door. I mean, whichever virus infects your cell is gonna copy itself, identical copies of itself, and then leave as that virus again. So I say, 
the way that, the same way the virus came into your cell is the same way the virus leaves your cell. What does that mean now, more specifically? Well, that, here, here's the tough part, right here. If the virus comes in as plus RNA, that means it's ready to do what? Translate. Translate. It will do that. It will make, uh, uh, sorry, it will translate and it will make viral proteins. What are the viral proteins? The capsomeres and the spike proteins. Where does it get the information to make these viral proteins? The information is contained in the genome of the virus. Okay, so it made the package. Imagine taking a package to the post office, deliver it to your cousin in California, and your cousin opens the box and finds nothing in it. Then you're gonna get a phone call. So obviously, the package that the virus is gonna make, it has to put something in it. You agree? Because it has to leave the same way it entered, and I don't mean the same door, I mean the same virus. So if the virus came in as plus RNA, it will leave as plus RNA. That means, what is it gonna put inside the package plus RNA? But you gotta watch this, so that, here's the part. Here's the tough, tough part. When it goes to copy the plus RNA, what will it become? Minus RNA. And it can't put that one in there. Because if it goes and puts minus RNA into the package, then it's going to leave differently. Do you see? It came in as plus RNA. It cannot leave as minus RNA. But the problem is, I only have one plus RNA, and I have 10,000 packages. Do you see that? The virus makes, for example, 10,000 packages. But it only has one plus RNA. Okay, copy it. It becomes minus RNA. That doesn't solve it. Number one, I only have one still. Number two, it's minus RNA. Can't do that. So what do I do now? Take the minus RNA and do what? Copy, 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 copy. see? It's like me taking your exam and go to the copy machine and copy, 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 copy. I can make any, as many as I want. So the first time the virus will use the plus RNA, it will be for making the proteins. But then it's gonna realize, I have to put something inside it. Okay, that means I need copies. So when it goes to copy it, it realizes, oh, hang on, there's another problem. It's minus RNA. So I will use this as the template now and copy, 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 and then I'll make 10,000 of these. And then I put one of these in one of these and release as a virion. One of these in one of these and release as a virion, you see? So now, the virus leaves the same way it entered. Are we catching that one? It's gonna get a little tougher too, I got it. The next one, the next example, like the influenza virus, that one is a minus RNA. So it's not ready for translation until it does what? Copies. Good, then that's what they're showing you. The minus RNA is gonna copy itself first into plus RNA. Now it has the ability to mix a lot of copies. So it's gonna copy itself to minus RNA so that this one, sorry, to plus RNA, so that this one is used to make the, trans, the proteins. You catch it? It's translation. You see? And this one is going to be used to copy back to minus RNA. So I take this one, copy to minus RNA. Take this one, copy to minus RNA. Wow. I make so many copies of these so I can package them. See, the virus came in as minus RNA. It has to leave as minus RNA. But when it goes and copies this, it makes plus RNA. So I can't package this one. But I need this one to make the proteins. So I use some of them to make the proteins. I use the other ones to copy back to minus RNA, and I'm pack packaging these two. 
You see that? It's these two that are coming together to leave as a virion. And now the virus leaves the same way it entered, minus RNA. Yeah, but you, <clears throat> excuse me, you still have a positive RNA in that cell. Is that why technically when you get sick and then you get, when you have antibiotics, you still technically have the virus in you? Now, see, this positive that? RNA, that, uh, all, your, uh, all the RNA molecules have a certain half-life. Mm -hmm. It's like, they degrades over time. Yeah. yeah, it will degrade over time. The, the purpose of this is to synthesize the components of the virus, assemble them, and leave. But the virus has to leave the same way it entered. Well, it came in as minus RNA. So it has to copy the minus RNA, the plus RNA, to make the proteins, and then take the copy of the plus RNA to use it as a template to make as many minus RNAs as it needs. But then eventually, if your cell is still alive, this will eventually degrade. If your cell is still alive. Some of these cells, at the end of it, they burst, they lice, they die. Oh, I yeah. Because you only have one positive RNA and 10,000 packages. Okay. See, if you have one toy and 10,000 box, boxes, only one kid will be happy. 9,999 kids will not be happy because they will, have, they will receive empty boxes. You see that? Mm -hmm. So how do I make everybody happy? Copy, 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 and put one in each box. But when I go copy it, the problem now is that when I copy the first one, it's only it's minus RNA. I can't put that in there, so I have to copy it back to plus RNA. Okay. Yeah. In your HIV, how do you go from? Hang on with HIV. Mm -hmm. Hang on with that. One. Okay. So it's like if you had the toy, you do the reverse. You find or you make the blueprints for it, and then you use that blueprint to make oh, thousands oh, I, of toys. I love it. I love it. Thank you for that. Can I use that? Yeah. Good. For free. Yeah, good, thank you. Nice, nice, nice. You have to also, I'm giving you some example analogies, but if you can come up with something that you can relate to, that's fine. Who am I to say no? All right, here's another one. What about a virus that has double-stranded RNA? It has both kinds. It has the plus and the minus RNA. So it can afford taking one of the strands, which is the plus one, to make the proteins. And it can even use the same strand to double-strand it to make the double-stranded RNA so it can package it. So because it's double-stranded RNA, it has both strands, the plus and the minus. It can use its plus strand to make the proteins. It can also use it to make copies to make the other strand. The only difference between this one and this one is that these two strands don't come together. They can't because they, the, the virus came in a single-stranded RNA. But the difference here is that they stay together because it came in as double-stranded RNA. We're catching that one? We're gonna hold off on the HIV. Let me show you what the DNA one does. The single-stranded DNA virus will enter your cell all DNA viruses will enter your cell and they will shoot for your nucleus. It's sort of like the unwanted guest coming in and it does not even say hello to you, it goes to your pool. You see? It will shoot to your nucleus because that's where your DNA is. And what does it want to do? It wants to get in between your genes it goes like this to your genes. Hey, you, 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 move over. I'm coming in. That's called integration. It integrates into your chromosome. You have that virus for life. You cannot get rid of it unless you kill that cell. You have it for life, like herpes, for example. Like HIV, for example. But HIV is an interesting story. Hang in there. So herpes, for example, that's a double-stranded DNA virus. It doesn't do it. It just goes straight to your pool. It comes with the swimming suit on, ready to go. Suntan lotion, ready to go. But this guy doesn't have his suit on yet. So he has to put it on first, you see? 
it comes in as single-stranded DNA, it has to become double-stranded DNA, and then it goes to your pool. Maybe that's a weird analogy, but it works. <laughs> so the, the DNA viruses, whether they're single-stranded or double-stranded, they will eventually end up in your nucleus and integrate within your genome. You have them for life. The only difference between these two is this guy is ready to go. This guy has to be double-stranded first. Why? Because your DNA is double-stranded. See, if your DNA was single-stranded, which it's not, then this would not have to need, we need to do that. But it's not, so we don't have to worry about that. Are we catching that? And then it can sit there in your DNA and do nothing. Nothing. It just invades your cell, gets into your DNA, and just sits there. And then once in a while it says, ah, oh, it's time to make viruses. And that's called a flare-up. So people that have herpes, for example, whether it's HSV1 or HSV2, they can have a long period of time without flare-ups. But as, for, any, for a given reason there, it activates and it causes a flare-up. And then it settles back down. And then it activates again later and so forth. So it goes through the cycles of latent cycles and so forth. So we'll talk about that too. The HIV is interesting, interesting. Now that we know what uh, the RNA ones do and what the DNA ones do in general, the, R, the uh, HIV is interesting because it, it's kind of like takes parts of this one and parts of that one puts it all together. The HIV is called a retrovirus. Retroviruses start out as RNA but end up as DNA. So you're gonna be confused with this. Don't do this. It is plus RNA, so you would think it's ready for translation. Am I right? Not this one, because it's a retrovirus. Retroviruses will eventually end up in your nucleus because they actually become DNA. So there's an enzyme that it uses to copy the plus RNA to DNA and then double strand it and then go to the pool. You see? Now we don't have this enzyme, thank God. So what do you think the virus is going to do? What did I say? It's going to come with it. And that enzyme is called reverse transcriptase. The enzyme is called reverse transcriptase. Look how clever whoever named this enzyme was. Watch this. General biology. Ignore this for now. General biology. DNA to RNA is what? Transcription. What would this be? Reverse transcription. Because it's the reverse of transcription, get it? There's an enzyme for that, so whoever named this said, oh, it reverse transcript. Ace, because ace means, A-S-E means what? Say it louder. Enzyme. Enzyme, yeah. Can't hear you from here, guys. Enzyme. Any word that ends with A-S-E means enzyme. So look how clever the person was. Huh? Reverse transcription and went to lunch, right? So it does it's the reverse of transcription. He or she called it reverse transcription. Reverse transcriptase will copy the RNA to DNA and will double strand it. It does both of them. Once it's double stranded, it is no different than the double stranded DNA virus. It will go into your nucleus, integrate into your DNA, sit there, and then once in a while, does what? Activates. This guy infects a key player in the immune system called the helper T cell. That's why this guy knocks out the immune system 
of the patients because the helper T cell is a major player of your immune system. I'm not, I mean, the other players are there, they just don't have the boss. The boss is the helper T cell. So this guy happens to infect the boss, the helper T cell. So even though you, the patients may have all the other components of the immune system, they never get the order, the marching orders, to go and fight because the boss is infected with the virus at the helper T cell. And we'll show you why they specifically target the helper T cell. Now, the other thing in the last couple of minutes here is if we look at these pictures, we realize something. If we're talking about the minus RNA and the plus RNA and the double-stranded RNA viruses, listen to it. Everything happens in the cytoplasm. If we're talking about minus plus RNA and double-stranded RNA, the first three that we talked about, everything happens in the foyer. The uncoding, the synthesis, the assembly, and eventually, of course, release, right? So that's what this picture is showing you. Is the nucleus involved at all? No, because we're dealing with the RNA viruses. If it, it happens to be an enveloped virus, on its way out, it will be taking a piece of your membrane, of your cell membrane. Now, if it's a DNA virus, the initial steps, the penetration and the uncoding happens in the cytoplasm. But then it will shoot towards your nucleus, the DNA will go towards your nucleus and it will integrate into your genome. And then once in a while, it will activate to make viruses. Now watch, listen, there's a problem with this one. The nucleic acids that it's making is DNA because it's DNA. DNA viruses will make DNA. DNA does not leave your nucleus, thank God. Imagine if DNA leaves your nucleus. That's like mom and dad moving out. You don't want that. You like mom and dad. Because who gave you your DNA? Mom and dad. Well, it's the same idea. Your nucleus says, no, no, DNA leaving, no way. So the DNA, the nucleus doesn't know if that's a viral piece of DNA or your DNA. It says no to DNA leaving. You mean, wait a minute, hang on, we have a problem here. The DNA is trapped in the nucleus but the viral proteins are made in the cytoplasm. See, the RNA will leave like any other RNA. Gene expression, general biology, mRNA, that you make an mRNA, it leaves the nucleus for translation outside because the ribosomes are outside. Well, this mRNA, which is viral, is no different than any other mRNA. It will leave the nucleus and make proteins out here. But these proteins are viral proteins. So watch, the DNA is in here, and the viral proteins in, are in here, are out there. How are they gonna assemble? How are they gonna assemble if they're in two different compartments and the DNA cannot leave? So what's the solution? The viral components go in? Yeah, the proteins come in, look at the picture. The DNA cannot leave, but the viral proteins can come in. So the assembly is happening here in the nucleus. Whereas the RNA viruses, where was the assembly? in the cytoplasm. Difference, right? There's a difference here. And as soon as you see that there's a difference, there's a potential question on the exam for it, on it. So, the vir RNA viruses, everything happens in the cytoplasm. Now when you come to the DNA virus, hang on. The, uh, the synthesis of the DNA is happening in the nucleus. The synthesis of the viral particles, the proteins, are happening in the cytoplasm. That means these guys have to come into the nucleus for assembly. So the assembly is happening in the nucleus. nucleus. And that's no different between that DNA viruses and eventually um, the retroviruses. The only difference in the retrovirus is that you're gonna put an, an MR, uh, a plus RNA in the package. Then, when it goes and leaves, if it is enveloped, there's a good chance that it will take this envelope with it, not the plasma membrane envelope. Because remember, your nucleus is 
has two envelopes, not just one. So it assembles the, it assembles it on the new Google Yes, and then in the cytoplasm, it's like... If the assembly is happening in the cytoplasm, then it's an RNA virus. Oh. If the assembly is happening in the nucleus, then it's most likely a oh. DNA virus. Okay, I think you guys had enough. The cool thing is, when we come back and start talking about the, the rest of the slide, it's almost like a review. So it's not like there's a whole bunch of new information here. No, no, you'll notice that, oh, this is the ringing of the doorbell. This is the penetration. This is what, it's kind of like a review, and then we give you new information. I'll see you on Tuesday. Your exam grades will be posted soon. Tonight or tomorrow.